for, for those who weren't able to attend. Um, so this one will focus on the LES humanities, so hopefully you're all in the right place. Um, if not, there's plenty of information there that will pertain to, to any major. Um, so as an overview, um, this event is to really go over why should you study abroad at all? What are the benefits for humanities majors? Um, the types of programs that are available, um, the types of academic um, environment that you'll, you could experience abroad, the um, uh, high level um, experiences you can add on as such as internships, service learning and research abroad. Then we'll go into the full application process for studying abroad, all the funding resources. Um, we'll pepper in some stories from alumni throughout and then we'll go over some program highlights for uh, specifically for the programs for humanities majors. Um, then at the very end, we'll go over next steps and have some time for questions. So if you think of any questions throughout the whole presentation, feel free to put them in, a ch in the chat. Um, you don't need a whole lot of them to the very end, but I will answer them at the end. All right, so just to start, this is just a activity to see what um, what what you guys are thinking. So give me either a thumbs up with emojis or since you have some of you have your cameras on, just give me an actual thumbs up um, if you've ever traveled abroad before. All right, I definitely have. No, a couple have not. Excellent. Um, if you speak a language other than English. I do. A couple of us. All right. If you feel strongly about a major global issue. Couple of us already. Uh, if you want to gain new perspectives, perfect. If you want to participate in opportunities such as internships, research, or service learning, excellent. And you enjoy interacting with others from diverse backgrounds. I would hope so. <laughs> and then if you want to study abroad, if you're here to learn more about study abroad because you're ready to get uh, started on the process, excellent. All right, so why study abroad at all? Um, we really highlight the three benefits of it. There's personal benefits, professional benefits, and academic benefits. Uh, personal benefits being you can increase your self-confidence, develop intercultural competency, gain direction and clarity to your goals. This is one that we hear from a lot. Um, you can discover new interests and passions. Um, for professional benefits, um, it's uh, great to develop transferable and soft skills expand your professional network and gain real world experience by interning or conducting research abroad. And we have increasingly more programs that offer those kind of experiences. So there really are a lot of opportunities to, to do all three of those things. Then academic benefits, uh, you can add an international or comparative dimension to your degree, earn UIC credit while living and studying in another country. And that's the big thing, it's not transfer credit. You are getting actual UIC credit, go straight towards your, gradu your graduation. Um, and you can understand alternative ideas and solutions to issues within your discipline. All right, and benefits for humanities. Um, it's a little broad, but uh, you can expand your humanities education beyond the classroom. Um, so this is a lot of that experiential learning. So experience other cultures and learn about history, literature, et cetera, directly from the source. Um, so you'll often see that a lot of your classes aren't going to be just in a classroom 24 seven. It's going to be, uh, you're going to have a lot more hands-on opportunities. And, um, really delve deep into, into what you're studying. You can also gain an understanding of collaborating with people from different cultures to help you understand how to work with people from different cultural backgrounds. And then we have a quote here from Javier Garcia, who is a philosophy major, um, and he participated in a faculty directed program um, in Italy a couple years ago. In terms of my philosophy major, I attended a divine comedy course and came to learn of other Italian philosophers. Once I arrived in Italy and was in some of the cities that these influential individuals were in, it uh, left me with a sense of humility and feeling of appreciation towards philosophy that my interest in the discipline only grew. That's what we love to hear. All right, so our team, um, we're a small team um, and we're here in University Hall room 502 every day, Monday through Friday. Um, so depending on what program you end up on and what um, you end up meeting with advisors throughout the whole your whole study abroad process, you might meet with any all five of us or any one of us. Um, so Kyle Rausch is our executive director. He's been with our office about a year and a half. Um, and we're really excited about the direction that he's taking our office since he's joined. Everything's been virtual, so we've had to 
revamp a lot of our processes and like for example we redid our whole website um, our whole application process so uh, he's been really great with the direction that we're going in for the office um, Irina Kromova is our senior associate director. Oh, I also just mentioned Kyle also reviews um, scholarship applications. So if you need a scholarship application reviewed, he's one of uh, two advisors that will do that. Irina is our senior associate director. She has um, been at the office pretty much since its beginning. Uh, she advises mostly for programs in Asia and Africa, as well as a couple other programs in Europe. Um, and. Uh, works with a few of the faculty directed programming. Marley Stein is our associate, associate director. She has a portfolio in Spain and Latin America, as well as a couple other countries in Europe. Um, and she's also the other advisor that will do scholarship um, reviews. Um, so you may work with her um, quite a bit if, if you're interested in doing more about scholarships. Um, then we have Crystal Williams, who's our assistant director, and she is a, has a portfolio in um, most English speaking countries, as well as France, um, and as uh, the director for all of the um, exchange programs that we offer. And we'll go into more of what those means in a minute and what those mean in a minute. And then my name is Maggie Miller. I'm the study abroad advisor in the office. Um, I've been around for a few years now. I do, I run all of the first step info sessions that we um, offer for the office. And I also man the SAO email account. So if you've ever emailed me, I've been the one to respond to you. Um, and uh, you may see my face more and more throughout um, your, your study abroad process. Um, you can make an appointment with us on iAdvise. Um, so if you go to go to UNSC, go.uic.edu slash SAO advising. It'll go right to our, our advi I advise page and you can make an appointment with any one of us. All right, so where can you study abroad? Um, there's, we have over 200 programs, so there's quite a few to choose from. And even since I made this map, we've added new locations. So I know for a fact this is missing, you know, at least like five or six different countries that we've added programs for. Um, so we're constantly re, um, you know, re-looking at the, the opportunities that we have open to students. Um, so yeah, there's over 200 programs right now in I think 54 countries. Um, so no matter what you're interested in or what region, um, I'm sure we can find a program that'll fit those needs. All right, and what types of programs are there? There are faculty-directed programs, partnership, and exchange programs. Now the words, the actual like what that means, like it kind of varies and it's not, you don't have to remember exactly what type of program it is, um, but just this is just to break down the subtle differences between them. Um, so faculty directed programs, these tend to be shorter term. They happen during the summer and academic breaks like winter break or spring break. Um, they're, they're led by UIC faculty members. So they're created in conjunction with our office um, by uh, UIC faculty members. We'll hear from one in a little bit about his uh, program that he's leading this year um, or next year, I should say. Um, and the benefit of a faculty directed program, it is directly UIC coursework that you take abroad. Um, so whereas for the other programs, their course equivalencies that you do get approved as UIC credit, the faculty directed programs are UIC coursework abroad, which is a big benefit. Um, partnership programs, these are the bulk majority of the programs that we offer. We partner with universities and organizations throughout the world um, to offer programs to our students. So um, they can be summer or semester long. Um, we have them as short as like three, four weeks in the summer and as long as you can do a full academic year if you want. Um, they're organized by our pro pro program partners. Um, so like I said, there's different organizations in universities that we work with to provide these. Um, there's a couple different options of the kind of academic experience that you'll get, um, either the study center or local university. So at the study center, you're at the organization's you know, center in the city that you're studying abroad in. You're taking classes with other typically American students who are studying abroad in the same program as you. Um, and they may bring in, they'll bring in local professors. Um, but the majority of these types of programs are the, the coursework is in English. Um, so no matter where you are in the world, if you're at a study center, um, it's likely that, they're, that the coursework is available in English um, with a few exceptions. but. Um, yeah, and then the other option would be to study at a local university. So this is just going to be like you're direct, directly enrolling in another university, you're taking classes with 
local students, international students. Um, it, it kind of depends on, on the program that you choose. But um, so those are the two different you know, main uh, types of experiences you'll have for a partnership program. And then course equivalencies. Uh, we'll get into a little bit later about a course approval process, but um, you do get UIC credit for all the courses that you take. Exchange programs, um, they're primarily a semester or academic year. Um, and the biggest difference between the exchange and the partnership program is that you pay your regular UIC tuition while you study abroad on an exchange program. Um, so this is great for certain types of students who receive like the like veterans benefits or something like that, um, where the um, you can apply those uh, financial benefits to to an exchange program. Um, and for exchange programs, you take classes at the local university in the host country's language, typically. Um, so we do have a lot of exchange programs in English speaking countries um, and then a few uh, programs in non English speaking countries still have offer coursework in English. Um, but for all exchange programs, you take classes at the local university with other local or international students. The great thing about exchange programs is that there are a wide variety of options for, for course offerings. So no matter what you're studying, I'm sure that we'll be able to find you uh, um, an exchange program that, that would fit your needs. As you can see here, this is just a little bit of uh, illustrates the differences between some of the programs. Um, so exchange programs don't offer short term and summer programs, with one exception, there's one program that is in the summer. Uh, financial aid, you can apply to all programs, no matter the type. Um, there are internships available through faculty directed and partner programs. Um, currently, there's none through exchange. Uh, for taking classes at local universities, um, you're going to find this in partnership direct enroll programs, which is when you do directly enroll in a, in a university or exchange. Uh, coursework is available in English in all, pretty much all locations with a couple exceptions, um, but yeah, you can pretty much study anywhere and still study in English. Um, tuition waiver eligible. So this is what I was discussing earlier about like the veterans benefits. Um, this applies only to exchange programs. It's pretty rare. So if you have any questions about like the scholarships you receive, uh, your study abroad advisor can discuss those with you. All right, academics abroad. Um, so depending on the program you choose, you're going to be um, having a different academic experience. Um, regardless, all of the courses that you take count as UIC credit, and they do count your towards your GPA um, and all graduation requirements. So students can get a major credit, minor credit, gen eds, or electives completed abroad, and it does all count as UIC credit, and you do get a letter grade for it. Um, there is a course approval process that you go through no matter the program you choose. Um, so there's, uh, you basically pick out the classes you want to take from the, the program and you meet with your academic advisor and you work with them to determine, oh, this will count as your philosophy 230 class or whatever it is, or this will count as your, you know, understanding world cultures gen ed or, or something like that. Um, so that's a whole process that your study abroad advisor will help you through. So you don't need to know that before you apply to any programs. Um, we'll help you through that whole process as you apply. Um, differences in academics abroad. Um, so for programs such as the faculty directed programming and maybe some of the, the study center programs, um, the coursework is going to probably look most like what you're used to in the United States, so at UIC. Um, whereas if you take classes at local universities, the um, the differences can be pretty great between the different uh, the experiences that you have. Um, for example, in I know in, in England or in, in the United Kingdom, a lot of your grade is based on a final exam or final paper, and there aren't little you know um, assignments throughout the whole term. So so that's something that we can help you um, manage your expectations for and make sure you know ahead of time what you're getting into because sometimes it is quite a shock if you get to a program and it's something you're not expecting and uh, it can be pretty stressful but we'll help you throughout that process as well. Um, and then the biggest difference again is going to be that experiential learning. Um, so this is going to be the hands-on, you know, visiting a site visit for most of our, for all of our faculty directed programs, especially, um, there's a lot of experiential learning involved. So you're not going to be sitting in a classroom for all, you know, four weeks of your, your program. Um, you're going to be doing site visits. You're going to be meeting local people. You're going to be working with local organizations. Um, 
and we'll hear a little bit more about um, one particular program um, that uh, Professor Ralph Centrone will be talking about in a minute um, and some of those experiences that you can expect. Uh, but this is the very exciting thing about studying abroad that you're not just gonna be sitting in a classroom. Of course, that's a component to it, especially for semester long programs, um, but there's a much more immersive and hands-on experience that you'll have. All right, and talking about that, it's more than just studying. Um, so even if you are in a classroom, that might not be your whole experience. Um, you can supplement your coursework with internships, research, and service learning. Um, so in all the programs that we offer with internships, um, the, the your placements are tailored to your professional and academic goals. So you'll have an advisor through your program that you'll work with to find a, a placement that's personalized for your interests. Um, so you're not just place some random thing depending on your major or anything like that. Um, they are English speaking internships throughout the whole world. So even in non English speaking countries, they often work with organizations and companies that um, are English language dominant. So you are able to have experiences even, you know, you know throughout the world of um, in, in, in a variety of disciplines that are in English, which is excellent. So you don't need to have that language prerequisite for for most programs. Um, also, you earn academic credit for every internship that you participate on. Um, in addition to the internship hours that you complete, there's also a course component to every internship. So most are about three credits, some are six credits if you're doing a more of like a full like a full time internship. Um, but depending on whether you go into summer or semester, um, your hours can look a little different. So, um, but yeah, they're available for for summers and semesters, which is great. Uh, research. There's undergraduate and gradu graduate research opportunities. Uh, you can gain experience working in local labs or with research teams, um, or you can also do an independent study, study project um, in whatever field you're interested in. Um, this can also complete capstone requirements if, if, if your degree has one. Um, service learning. You can engage with and give back to your local host community, uh, contribute to ethical and responsible service projects. Um, we are working to expand the academic credit opportunities for service learning. Um, in the past, they haven't been approved for credit, but we are looking at new programs that have a course component along with any service learning that you would do. Um, so there is a good chance that you'd be able to get academic credit for, for a service learning if that's something you're interested in. Um, and this is a great way to immerse yourself in a local in the local culture um, in an ethical and um, you know, sustainable way. Virtual international internships. So this is something newer for our office, but something that's really, really exciting. Um, so these are offered in collaboration with our um, like our partnership programs that we generally work with. Um, and these are great to prepare you for the current and future work context. <laughs> so remotely uh, and globally centered um, and culturally diverse workforce. So it's been very interesting, um, you know, obviously switching to virtual work for uh, the last year and a half and these experiences these virtual in, uh, inter internship experiences are an excellent way to um, get that experience um, and have that global context uh, to any um, any work that you do um, these like the other internships these are also tailored to your specific goals and interests so these um, you will also work with an advisor to have a specific placement. Um, currently, our student worker and one of our study abroad alumni, um, she received a scholarship, but she but study abroad was canceled for her the country she was going to study abroad in. So she instead is doing a virtual internship this semester um, through our office, and she just received work from her placement that she's working with a. Um, um, organization in in Amsterdam, um, so she'll be working with them throughout the semester, and it fits exactly with what her her career goals um, and like personal interests are. So she's very excited about that. So she just got her placement the other day. Um, again, these internships are English speaking, and they're available all all over the world. Um, and these are also paired with a course component, so it is credit bearing. Um, typically, about three credits you can expect um, for for one of these internships. Um, and along with just the credit in, um, aspect of it, they also include some professional development along with it. So they have career coaches, um, opportunities for, for seminars and webinars, um, and they also give you a career skills report at the end of your internship. So kind of a, um, 
a review of, of the, your, the quality of your work and quantity of your work that you did. Um, all right, so switching gears. How do you get started? What's the application process look like? Um, the first thing you need to do is attend a first step info session. Um, we have these posted on our website, so there's links to it um, from our homepage. Um, you, there's a video you can watch anytime on your own time, or you can also attend one live. This semester we are doing them live via Zoom and in person in our office where you get to meet me and uh, talk about studying abroad some more. <laughs> but um, yeah, this is a great option to get started immediately, no matter when you want to study abroad. Um, it's required at one point before you study abroad, but it doesn't matter when you do it before you study abroad, and you only need to do it once. So it's excellent information on the process, different programs you can look at, and um, you know how to get started. Um, the next thing you want to know is your application deadlines. Um, so the deadlines depend on the term you want to study abroad in, but in general, you always apply the semester before you study abroad, and we always recommend getting it as early as possible. Um, sometimes we may open up applications earlier. Uh, for example, for like faculty directed summer programs, we may off maybe may open them up in the fall. But in general, you apply the semester before you go abroad. So right now, we are just about to start accepting applications for uh, programs that start next semester and they'll be due October 15th. Um, and then if you're looking at doing a summer or fall 2022 program, we will open up applications in January. And those will be due March 11th, I believe. Uh, we always post them on our website though, the deadlines. Um, the next thing is to review eligibility requirements. Um, so make sure you're eligible to study abroad. What does this mean? Um, you have to be an active current UIC student. So even if you're not enrolled in classes this semester, you had to have been enrolled within, I think it's two semesters um, before your study abroad program. Um, you have to be in good academic standing and you have to be um, have a good, um, rather you can't have any discipline records on, on, on file. Um, but that's, that's it. You don't have to have a certain amount of credits. Most programs will have a GPA requirement, but we as an office don't have a, a general GPA requirement. Um, so even if, if that's something you're worried about, we can find a program that has flexibility in that. Um, but as long as you're in good academic standing, you are eligible to study abroad and we'll help you find a program. Uh, the next thing is to choose a program. This is the biggest next step you have is to find the program that will work for you. Um, so there's a couple ways you can do this. You can either meet with an advisor and um, they can go over the different programs within their portfolios, um, or you can look on our website. We have an awesome program search that we just redid front to back. So it has a lot more information for every location that we uh, have, all, every program that we offer. Um, so it also looks really cute now. It looks really pretty now. It has pictures on everything um, and it's very well organized. So we're very excited about these new program brochures. They'll have a lot of information for you. Um, once you do that, once you pick a program, you need to apply. Um, we just redid our application process. So everything will be online through the Flames Abroad portal. Um, and you can find this at go.uic.edu slash flames abroad. Um, this is also just our general program search. Um, and then once you find the program that you're interested in applying for, you can either log in here or there will be a button on the right hand side of your interested program that just says apply now or apply here. All right, funding study abroad. Most questions we ever get about any students who want to go abroad is how do I pay for it? Um, luckily, we have the answers for you. We can help you figure that out. Um, so when you're thinking about studying abroad and the cost of study abroad, um, we have created this, this cost of attendance comparison. Um, so when we talk about cost of attendance, it's not just tuition. It's the tuition, it's the fees, it's the housing you costs you have to calculate in. Um, it sometimes includes meals. It um, has uh, inter, um, international health insurance you have to consider, um, you know, on-site transportation, so like local transportation. Um, we have calculated all of that into the costs of studying at UIC and then studying abroad. Um, so as you can see, the two main costs of attendance for UIC, we have in-state here and out-of-state here. Um, so we have some programs that are much more and some that are much less than studying at UIC. So when you keep when you have everything else in mind for the, the cost of attendance for, for both of them, um, it can 
have a very wide range uh, of costs associated with that program. Um, so if the if your budget is something of concern, I'm sure we can find a program in your that will fit your interests that also fits your budget. Um, so just know that that is definitely an option that there are definitely some that are less than, than UIC. Definitely some more too, but there's ways to make up the differences if you work for it. Um, so on every program brochure that we have online, we will add in these cost sheets and it'll display everything that you should expect to um, have in terms of expenses for your term abroad. Um, and then you can also, there's a, it's a cool tool you can use to enter in your typical financial aid and scholarships you plan on receiving. Um, and you can kind of play with it to create your own budget. Um, so it's gonna be a very useful tool. It's still in the process right now of getting implemented, but um, you should be able to see it um, throughout the semester. Uh, financial aid and revised cost of attendance. This is kind of what we talked about already, but just know that all your financial aid that you receive at UIC um, with very, very few exceptions, all of it will go with you while you study when you study abroad. So especially for a semester program, any like Pell Grant, MAP Grant, Opportunity Grant, um, any loans that you receive, other financial aid and external scholarships, you can always use those for your program fees. Uh, for summers, it's a little more limited just based on um, the, the types of financial aid that you receive. However, federal Pell Grant is typically available in the summer, so you can usually use that to study abroad in the summers. Um, and then regardless of financial need or merit or anything, there are tons of scholarships you can apply for. Um, so your study abroad advisor will be able to help you identify the exact scholarships you qualify for. But in general, there are study abroad office scholarships, um, UIC departmental scholarships, and sometimes specific majors will have a scholarship, colleges, um, et cetera. Um, there's nationally competitive scholarships, um, and then there's program specific scholarships. These are uh, scholarships available just for specific programs. Um, we also, for many of our semester programs and some summer programs as well, we have uh, negotiated discounts for UIC students with our program partners. Um, so even when you look up the like program fees online, the full costs, um, it won't reflect the discount specifically for UIC students. Um, so that is something that we can um, go over when you meet with an advisor. They can let you know of certain discounts that you have for any of the programs you're interested in, um, but that, that is good news. That sometimes there are some hiding uh, discounts on there. And those should be also reflected on the, the cost sheets um, when we put them on a line. Um, Community-based funding, this is also a great tool to um, make up some differences in, in costs, uh, especially for like uh, personal expenses and things like that. So these are great, like their GoFundMe campaigns or their um, education specific ones, study abroad specific ones, um, where you can um, reach out to your community to, um, to make up some of the, the difference. And we have some tools on our website um, about community-based funding, if that's something you're interested in. So one of the nationally competitive scholarships we want to take a look at is the Gilman International Scholarship. Um, and I'll quickly go through it just because it's, it's something that you'll also talk about in, in any meeting that you have with an advisor. Um, the Gilman International Scholarship is for Pell recipients only, um, and the McCain, Gilman McCain Scholarship is for child dependents of active duty military service members. So these awards could be up to $5,000 for a semester program. I think it's up to $3,000 for a summer program, um, or $8,000 for any program if you're studying a critical need language. So these are like Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Arabic, a couple others. Um, would possibly qualify for, for an $8,000 award. Um, so you always apply again the semester before you go or two semesters before you go. This one is one that's open um, a little earlier. So if you wanted to get started, even if you're studying abroad this summer and you wanna get started a little early, um, they are accepting applications now for summer programs. Um, the great thing about this is they just removed um, the length requirement. There used to be a length requirement for programs, but now it is open to any international program, uh, which is great news. Um, we have some info sessions coming up. Um, these are posted on our website as well, but we have one on Friday and then one next week as well. Um, these are info sessions just about how the Gilman, the Gilman uh, scholarship works. 
In addition to that, we do have scholarship writing workshops. Um, so these are workshops that we have um, created to help you put together a really great application. Uh, a lot of these nationally competitive scholarships, um, it seems daunting. There's a big application. You have to write a couple essays. Um, it's nationally competitive, so it's not just open to UIC students. But I will let you know that we receive um, we have UIC students every single semester who receive money from Gilman. Um, so it is something that is attainable and we will help you make it work. Um, so we review best practices for scholarship essays. We help you strengthen your writing skills and we help you brainstorm effective ways to highlight your diversity, identity and goals in your study abroad scholarship essays. Um, and we can also review them after you've written them um, before you uh, submit them, which is great. Um, and so these we have next week and the following week for some workshops. All right, testimonials. Um, we love hearing from our students after they come back. So if you do study abroad, we love hearing hearing from you about your experience. Um, we have a quote here from Javier Garcia. Uh, I think I quoted him earlier. Uh, philosophy, uh, who studied abroad in Salerno, Italy. He said, study abroad taught me to take a step back and appreciate the little things in life. We can often lose ourselves while working towards the future that we forget to care for ourselves, both physically and mentally. I learned to take a break if I'm overstressing myself about a particular problem and to practice self-care. It's important at UIC or studying abroad. Um, then we have Aureli Granados, who's a criminology, law and justice um, and sociology majors. And she studied abroad in IES Salamanca, Spain. Uh, studying abroad empowered me and helped me become more confident. I learned about myself and what I want out of life. The best part was being able to spread my wings and travel to places I always dreamed of visiting. It's an experience everyone should witness. And then we have Michelle Moy, who's a re, who was a rehabil, uh, rehabilitation sciences major, and she studied abroad in uh, Kunming, China. Study abroad taught me to be open-minded, adventurous, and to take advantage of opportunities. As a Chinese Filipino American, I chose China not only to learn about traditional Chinese medicine, but to connect with my Chinese roots. Within four months of traveling, making lifelong friendships, and absorbing Chinese culture like a sponge, I was able to connect uh, with the culture that I was so eager to learn about, and my experiences have shaped my personal interests and career goals. All right, so we're gonna quickly go through some um, programs that are open for humanities students. Um, this is kind of a blessing and a curse, but there are many, many, many programs to choose from for humanities majors. Um, so just know that this is not an exhaustive list. I didn't even list specific programs just because there are programs all over the place for humanities majors. So for Black Studies, we have programs in Austria, France, Ghana, Madagascar, South Africa, Tanzania, and the United Kingdom that offer coursework in Black Studies. Um, English, um, I don't even need to list all of the, the, the countries, but um, you know several countries that offer programs in, uh, in for that have coursework in English um, or literature in general. Um, history, there's probably over 150 programs <laughs> that would offer history courses. It's a, you know, a, a very important part of studying abroad. So it's offered in almost all programs. Um, Latin American Latino studies, we have programs in, throughout Latin America um, and Spain. Uh, philosophy, um, again, programs throughout the world. All right, and exchange programs. Um, the nice, like I said earlier, the nice thing about exchange programs is that they offer a wide variety of coursework. So a lot of them um, offer pretty much in any any uh, field of study that you're interested in. We have Cardiff University, Chiba University, um, EM Normandy, Kwanzaa Yaquim University, National Taiwan University, Tech de Monterey, Maggie. University of Ant. Yes. Uh, where's the stuck on the funding study abroad slide? Oh, let me, thank you for letting me know. Hmm. And of course it froze. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, we can. Are we still here? Yeah. 
Yes. Yes. You can all hear me? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, anyway, let's see where we are. All right. All right, can we see the, the partnership program highlights page? Okay, thank you guys so much for bearing with me. Um, yeah, technology can't even cooperate when we've been doing this for a year and a half now. <laughs> um, anyway, as I was saying, as you can see here, there's tons of programs available all over the world. Um, we don't need to repeat that though. Um, in addition to exchange programs um, throughout the world. We have programs, all of these um, programs offer coursework in English as well. I think it's important to say. So no matter the host language uh, or the language of the host country, um, we do have programs that, that offer coursework in English in, for exchange programs. All right, and uh, faculty directed programs. Um, we have several that are um, designed to be for, for this coming year, either for spring or summer of 2022, that would work very well for, for any humanities majors. Um, so we have Italian language, culture and the arts um, in Rome, Salerno and Siena, Italy. Um, Dutch and American families as they really are in Amsterdam, Netherlands. Oh, that was a typo, excuse me. Um, pop art and culture that rocked British society in the 1960s. This is a spring break program in London. Um, so you would take a course throughout the spring semester and then have a spring break um, international experience in London. Um, Roman art and architecture in Rome, Italy. Social justice, language and identity in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, and we have Professor Kim Patowski joining us today as well, I see. Um, who is uh, directing that program. Um, then we have Spanish language and culture in Alcalá de Henares in Spain, which is just outside of Madrid. And then we have understanding Korean history, culture, and society in Seoul, South Korea. Um, so um, I thought we would go over, we do have uh, Professor Ralph Centrone as well to go over the program that we have um, specifically designed for uh, Latin American Latino studies um, this summer um, in August for in, in Puerto Rico. So Ralph, I will mute myself and transfer over to you. Did you want me to um, stop sharing or do you want me to keep this open? Yeah, I think we can probably stop sharing. That would be a good idea. Excellent, considering especially since it crashed my computer a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, Pam. <laughs> nice to see you. Hi, same here. You want to go to Puerto Rico in the summer? <laughs> I do. I want to go to Puerto Rico all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, so <clears throat> um, we have been working on a, on a course, uh, a summer course in Puerto Rico. Um, I think the title uh, kind of flashed on the screen there. Can, can you show that, that title again? Because that probably explains quite a bit. Absolutely. Yeah, learning from Puerto Rico, environmental, economic, and political challenges for the future. Uh, so we've been organizing the course. Um, Jose Lopez is uh, one of our um, lecturers in the department, uh, and I'm one of the professors in the department. Um, and we both have a very specific interest in climate change. Um, and I don't know if the folks uh, on this call are specifically interested in this course or not. Um, if you have some, I mean, I, I think it might be best to just do this dialogically in some fashion or another. So at any point, if you have a question, I'll be happy to see if I can answer it. Um, but we're planning to do this um, in August, uh, early August. Um, and it's a course that will probably take uh, I would say 12 days, we'll spend around 12 days or so uh, on the island of uh, Puerto Rico. And um, it looks also as if there will be a week uh, here in Chicago where we kind of go over some basic things. And again, I don't know um, if you folks know anything about uh, Puerto Rico itself and its relationship uh, to the United States. 
um, but those are long standing, um, kind of difficult and problematic in, in many ways. Um, there's a whole long history um, of colonialism, uh, for instance. But one of the things that happened, and uh, we're particularly interested in it, uh, one of the things that happened before uh, Hurricane uh, Maria hit, and I'm sure that you all remember when Hurricane Maria hit, I mean, that was during the Trump administration and there were all of these, you know, videos and photographs of Puerto Rico. But one of the things that happened even prior to that um, was a series of disinvestments um, and a kind of uh, restructuring of the economy on the island. Um, and as a result, in the middle of that restructuring, uh, social services deteriorated somewhat, uh, certainly infrastructure deteriorated. Uh, so there were these problems with the electrical grid, uh, for instance, and so on, long before the hurricane hit. So when Hurricane Maria smashes into the island with very high winds, I think 140, 150 mile an hour high winds, a lot of that electrical grid um, just simply got blown away, quite frankly. Um, and there were some other struck, some other problems, particularly in the mountainous areas of the island. Um, a lot of the, some of the highways, some of the smaller highways, et cetera, were washed away. So anyway, what's the point of the course? The point of the course is to frame climate change um, and to think about climate change as a kind of accelerating thing. Um, oceans are ocean waters. We now know very specifically are getting hotter. Um, and as ocean waters uh, heat up, that provides more energy. And so the storms become larger. Um, and so Hurricane Maria seems to be an example of climate change itself, but also it's an example of um, an island whose economy is still weak um, and thus having to kind of fend for itself. Um, there have been lots and lots of problems with FEMA, for instance, entering into the island and being able to bring resources. Um, all of these kinds of issues are ones that we're going to be talking about. So we're going to be making visits to um, different research centers. Uh, we're going to be making visits to different scientists, a group of scientists at the Universidad de Mayagüez, some others at the University in San Juan uh, who do climate science research. But then we're also going to be visiting these um, sites in which uh, all kinds of um, initiatives are beginning to emerge. Uh, these would be initiatives that are trying to uh, respond to um, sustainability efforts and environmental efforts. Um, there's uh, one of the things in one of the towns um, is some work that's being done on solar energy, uh, for instance. There's another site visit to, a, I guess you would call it a kind of an experimental farm uh, in which uh, they're experimenting with different kinds of tropical foods and fruits um, that uh, perhaps might be better adapted to uh, accelerating conditions of uh, climate change, et cetera. Um, so there are these very specific sites with these different kinds of experts uh, who will be uh, telling us different kinds of stories about how the island itself is responding. I think one of the most unique things um, about the study abroad is, and again, I don't know if you know uh, anything about the politics of the island, um, but the politics of the island are very heated. There are our, there are at least um, three political parties. They represent very different kinds of um, ideologies. Um, and we have scheduled uh, some visits with different mayors of different cities. Um, and each of these mayors represent a different kind of uh, political orientation. 
So they will be telling us stories about their own, um, uh, you know, their own experiences with the economy um, and the politics of the island, particularly after um, Hurricane uh, Maria. But um, they will also be telling us about the specific ideologies um, and why they feel that this is the better route for, uh, for the island to take in terms of its port, um, in terms of its political orientation. So there's a very strong um, statehood party, uh, which uh, if you listen to the news, uh, they're trying to make some moves uh, into Congress right now. There's also a very strong status quo um, party uh, that also has longstanding influences in the United States Congress. And then there's a smaller um, independence party. So all of these different avenues, uh, does Puerto Rico become a state of the United States? Does Puerto Rico remain in its kind of autonomous relationship to the United States? Does Puerto Rico uh, become independent? All of these kinds of political discussions uh, will be talked about. And then the different kinds of economic uh, orientations. There's another, um, We'll be visiting some coffee farms uh, as well. Coffee was, is or was particularly one of the larger industries uh, on the island and then it collapses. Um, but now it's kind of in recovery mode. Um, we'll be seeing or we'll be making some visits to um, various museums. There's a museum in a particular town called Comerio. Uh, which was well known for tobacco plantations. And so we'll visit, you know, kind of like remnants um, of those kinds of sites. And we'll be talking about those kinds of local economies, how they flourished. Um, um, and, they, and again, the politics and the economics um, of why they changed. Um, there's a particular artist uh, for those folks who are interested in, in um, the arts. Um, there's a very well-known uh, artist in a town called Ponce, and his name is Antonio Maltorel. Um, and we'll be visiting his studios, um, and he'll be talking to the group. Uh, he has some very interesting, uh, again, um, political orientation, so he'll undoubtedly talk about that. But he's very interested in kind of like the arts movements in the Caribbean in general. Um, He's well known in New York City, well known in Chicago, actually. Uh, and he's done a lot of different kinds of particularly sculpture, sculpture works uh, in New York City. So there's a discussion with him as well. Uh, we'll also be visiting, um, there's a place called Caño Martín Peña, which is a tidal channel and a tropical estuary um, that's been, um, I guess you could say restored in some fashion. So there will be different places that we'll be taking a look at in which um, environmental restoration uh, has occurred. And I guess the last thing that I would like to mention, um, Jose and I, Jose Lopez is the, um, is the co-faculty director. Jose and I are very interested um, in Amerindian um, visions uh, of nature, for instance, because there's a kind of like a resurgence both on the island itself, but in Latin America in general. I'm, I'm a professor of Latin American Latino studies, so I'm always interested in these things. So there's kind of like a resurgence of uh, interest in Amerindian worldviews. Um, some people think that Amerindian worldviews are more sustainable um, in terms of the environment um, than say modern societies. I don't know if that divide really is an accurate one, um, but there's a lot of beliefs along those lines. So there are some, there's a, a considerable amount of literature that we'll be taking a look at um, and talking about uh, with regards to um, the Amerindian presence, what's left of it on the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, some sites, some archaeological sites that we'll also be going to, um, and so on. And then for me, um, I think one of the most fascinating things, which kind of is connected to all of this, 
there is a experimental station um, in this um, in this national forest. It's called El Yunque. It's very famous. Anyone who goes to Puerto Rico typically goes to the El Yunque, which I suppose you could translate as the a tropical jungle of some sort. So um, there is a lot of work, uh, some experimental work in watching um, the forest recover. Uh, so um, again, Hurricane Maria uh, came through and devastated um, that local that local spot. Um, but now it's beginning to regrow. Uh, and how it's regrowing is really kind of fascinating. Um, it's not regrowing all at once. It grows in its own very varied, complicated kind of way. But there are some um, foresters, some scientists that are doing work on the island with regards to tropical jungles, quite frankly, and how they represent um, historical adaptations uh, to hurricanes uh, and other kinds of things that uh, the Caribbean is susceptible to. So anyway, um, I, I hope that's a general description of uh, some of the things that we're going to be doing. Um, and I'm certainly happy to try to answer um, any questions to whatever extent I can answer them. Yeah, and just to add to that, uh, thanks so much for sharing. Um, and it'll be a three credit program that'll take place over the summer in August. Um, yes. There's a couple of details still being finalized, such as the, the total cost of it, the um, specific dates, but it'll be towards the end of August, um, closer to the start of school. Um, and uh, we will be releasing information as we have it for this program and we'll be posting it online. Um, in the meantime, if you are interested in it, you can always reach out to us and we can keep you in the loop as, as we do get more information on it. Or tell your friends. Uh, you know, exactly. Contact the study abroad office. Yeah. So I'm, again, I'm happy to answer any questions if, if anybody has them. All right, uh, so I'll switch back to the presentation right now if no one has any questions specifically about this program. Um, again, it's the first year we're doing it, so it's very exciting. It sounds like a, um, it'd be a great program, so I'm very looking forward to seeing how it, how it wraps up. Um, all right, going into general next steps. Um, the biggest next step you need to do uh, for any program, no matter when you wanna go abroad, is to apply for your passport. Um, Due to COVID-19, it can be very, very delayed. Um, so whether you're looking to go abroad next semester or next year or in two years, it's not a bad idea to start it now. Um, and then um, we also recommend to speak with your academic advisor. Um, so they are going to be your best resource to help you figure out when you are planning to study abroad. They can help you figure out when you have most flexibility in your degree, um, whether semester or summer would be best. Um, but they would be your best bet for, for that conversation. Um, then you should be attending the first step presentation. Um, again, this is, you can find it on our homepage, uh, links right to the first step. Um, then looking into picking a program and uh, researching funding resources. Um, and after, especially after you select a program or in your process to select a program, you can schedule an appointment with any of our study abroad advisors. Um, on our meet with an advisor page, uh, we highlight who work, who has portfolios in what locations. And on every single program brochure, as you look on our website, it tells you who the advisor is. Um, but if you ever have any questions about anything, um, including the process to apply for your application or your program, you can contact us at sao at uic.edu. Uh, again, this email comes straight to me, so it'll be, um, I can help you out with any question that you have or direct you to the right person. Um, I know I've mentioned our homepage a couple of times, that's studyabroad.uic.edu. Um, it's a great uh, you know, um, resource for you when you go through your whole process. Um, we recently you know, did it, redid it about a year ago, so it's a lot of updated brand new information. Um, 
another great resource is following us on Instagram. Uh, we have, uh, we post about all of our events that we have coming up. We post about new scholarship opportunities, new program opportunities. Uh, we post, we'll be posting information about all the faculty directed programs as the details are solidified. Um, so we will be posting about the Puerto Rico program shortly. Um, and, um, oh, that ended, but you can also, uh, get in touch with us on the phone or um, in person as well. Um, so having said that, um, does anyone have any questions about anything you've heard today in the process? Um, I know uh, Juliana had to leave us just now, so I'll respond to her question. She had a question about the Gilman um, by email, but does anyone have anything else? Yeah, I guess I was wondering about the uh, the first step meetings. Are those mostly happening on like in person on campus, or they I advise and you do it online and Zoom? You have a couple options. You can either watch the video online. Um, we post the link to it on our first steps page, so you can just watch the video. Um, and there's a short questionnaire that you have to complete after watching it. Um, or if you expect that you'll have a lot of questions and stuff and want to talk to advisor, you can schedule um, a first step on I advise. Um, I, I run them and I have six sessions a week, two of which are in person, four of which are virtual. Um, so it'll tell you on um, when you're scheduling it, whether it's in person or virtual. Alrighty, so if any of you have any other questions, of course you know how to contact us again. So I really thank you for, for joining today um, and we hope to see you soon and get you on the in the works of studying abroad, so. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Maggie. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day, guys. Thank you.